Thank you very much. It's always, always, always a pleasure to be here. Wait, two more always. This is my fifth visit. Uh, pleasure to be here in Krakow. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. The city becomes lovelier every time I come. Um, and I appreciate the fact that I have a very good working relationship with Artur, uh, who is kind enough to keep asking me to come back. Uh, today I'm going to be giving a presentation on relapsed and refractory myeloma. A good part of this is actually highlights from ASCO from just a couple months ago. Um, so a lot of this data is brand new, only about three months old, and gives you a flavor of what is ongoing at present in the treatment of relapse and refractory myeloma. Unfortunately, I am quite aware that most of the drugs I'm going to be speaking to you about are not available in Poland. I also am hopeful that at some time in the future you will have access to these drugs, at least you'll know about them, and then once they become available to you, you'll be able to utilize them for the treatment of your patients. But I, I'm quite aware of the limitation financially on uh, obtaining these agents that we're going to speak about today. <clears throat> so with transplants, which is going to be already been addressed once, um, we certainly get prolonged remissions in the absence of in the absence of maintenance therapy, the median duration of response is approximately 30 months, depending on which study we read and what the most recent updates are. With maintenance therapy, you can uh, achieve remission durations in the 50 to 55 month range. Unfortunately, these patients statistically all relapse. Uh, I was asked just earlier by one of our esteemed colleagues, do I think I've actually cured myeloma patients? And the answer to that is yes, I think I have cured a handful or more of myeloma patients, but those with allogeneic transplants, which is going to be addressed by uh, one of the other speakers, but allogeneic transplants probably can cure a small number of myeloma patients. In the absence of that, we do not cure the disease, but with our more um, intensive therapies and more effective therapies, a large fraction of my myeloma patients are not expiring from myeloma-related causes. They're expiring from other health issues, from other comorbid medical conditions. So in a sense, even though we're not curing the disease, we're prolonging it long enough that the patients will actually pass, for, uh, expire from other medical issues unrelated to their myeloma. So this slide is actually a little bit pertinent. Dr. Uh, Raji just gave you an unbelievable presentation on how to manage bone disease. So the question is, when patients relapse, what can you expect? What is their medical presentation when they relapse? This is a study done from the Mayo Clinic group where they actually looked at relapses after transplants. As you can see here, about 70% of the patients actually have biochemical relapse based on their serum protein electrophoresis, their urine protein electrophoresis, or free light chain assays. About 30% of the patients, though, relapse without a serologic mark or a serological marker. And it lists here what the likelihood of relapse is from non-serologic uh, disease uh, patterns. And of course, the, the highest one is seen with lytic bone disease as the first presentation, which is actually one of the reasons you probably should continue to treat the patients with bisphosphonates or with rank ligand inhibitors because of this data. So that it's very pertinent. No one knows for sure, as she already addressed, how often you should give it or how long you should get it. But of the 30% of the patients who relapse from non-serologic basis, the majority of them actually relapse from bone disease. Very important. So when you have a patient who relapses, you have to decide on when to treat and how to treat. Uh, all of us would agree you should treat with anybody who presents with crab features, bone lesions, renal insufficiency, hypercalcemia. And those patients who have a rapid rise in their paraprotein levels should also be treated in the absence of crab symptoms. And of course, there's those patients who have high risk disease based on cytogenetic prognostic indicators, the 414s and 17Ps, the 14s, possibly the 1416s which uh, I don't know if Artur would be nice enough to talk about a project we just put together with translocation 1416. But with high risk side genetics, you probably don't want to wait and to treat the patients till they have any symptoms because they can have very aggressive relapses. 
So there's also prognostic features, those with stage three disease, either by the ISS or revised ISS, based on their performance status, extramedullary disease, and so forth. You have to decide who, when, and how to treat the patients. Duration of response, obviously, is if you do well and have a good response, you're, you do well and have a good response. It's, 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 uh, it's self, uh, it's uh, prophetic uh, that you, if you have a good response and you stay in remission a long time, that that's a good thing. If you relapse within two years after a transplant, if you look at these curves here, this is data that's been put together, patients who relapse within two years of a transplant actually have a very poor survival long term. This is a very high risk group of patients, let alone if you relapse within 12 months after a transplant. So with that in mind, we're going to talk about some of the studies you already know about. The Pollux, Castor and Pollux trials. Pollux trial was daratumumab, lenalidomide dexamethasone. This showed an un unbelievably high response rate in patients with one to three lines of prior therapy. Response rate was 92% with remissions, complete remissions, approaching 50% with a monoclonal antibody, an imid, and a corticosteroid. This is long-term data from the same group showing um, the efficacy at 12 months and even at 18 months, and they haven't reached a median progression-free survival yet with daratumumab-based therapies in that original trial. It's now extending to about the, statistically, they think it's going to be about 42 months. If you do a salvage transplant in the same setting, there are essentially no data that says you get anywhere near 42 months with a salvage transplant compared to a combined immunotherapeutic regimen. So this is, this is still a very, very potent regimen. When you look at the long-term data, the estimated 30-month progression-free survival is now projected to be 58, excuse me, I said it was 40, 42 months. It's projected to be 58 months um, for 30 months, and it's the median progression-free survival is supposed to be over 42 months. So this is far superior than the standard arm, which was the lenalidomide dexamethasone arm. Similar data, not quite as impressive, was seen with the CASTER trial. The CASTER trial was daratumumab bortezomib dexamethasone. However, there's a couple little um, points that you really need to know about the CASTER trial. A fair proportion of these patients had had previous bortezomib exposure. So whenever you have a retreatment trial, you're not expected to have quite as high of a response rate or duration of response because the patients have already previously been exposed to that agent. So a good proportion of the patients on, the, on this trial had actually had previous bortezomib. And what they found again is that the daratumumab arm, excuse me, had a far superior outcome compared to the bortezomib arm of this trial. When they looked at MRD status, these are small numbers. If you see the red boxes here, particularly for the DRD, um, when you look at, excuse me, for the DVD, when you look at the number of patients here, when they show these great curves, they really look impressive, but when you actually look at the numbers of patients who achieved MRD negativity, it was not that great. But of those who did, they had an unbelievably high long-term remission rate, whether they got DRD or if they got DVD. But you should know that if you get good responses with conventional therapy, this is just let alone by dexamethasone, if you become MRD negative by whatever mechanism of treatment, you have a better outcome. So whether it's bortezomib dexamethasone, let alone by dexamethasone without the monoclonal antibodies. And this is true with transplant or no transplant. So if you get MRD negative, you have by, by far a better outcome long term. So that really is a good surrogate endpoint to get MRD negativity. I'm assuming one of my colleagues is going to talk about MRD negativity more than I'm going to do today. So one of the big hot topics in oncology besides, you know, is immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is a, kind of a broad term now, but of the immunotherapeutic agents, we certainly would consider the PD-1 and PDL one inhibitors and CTL-4 inhibitors to be one of the immunomodulatory agents to open up the immune system, if you will, to get uh, uh, better activity with drugs. The two that are currently uh, been looked at in myeloma are pembrolizumab and nivolumab. So at the ASCO meeting, they gave an update of pembrolizumab in combination with IMIDS. 
So they have two different trials, which I'm going to show you the data, one with lenalidomide in the upfront setting and one with pomalidomide in the relapse setting combined either with or without pembrolizumab, the PD-1 inhibitor. And these are the trial designs. I'm not going to go over them in any detail, but this is the triplet of pembrolizumab palm dex. This is in a relapse setting versus palm dex. This is the upfront trial of pembrolizumab lenalidomide dex versus len dex in the frontline setting thinking that based upon the phase two trials where these combinations of IMIDs and pembrolizumab had a su su significant activity in the upfront settings. What they found here in the looking at the pembrolizumab trial, the relapse setting, they found that the median overall survival wasn't reached in either group. When they looked at the events, there was actually higher number of events, excuse me, this is the lenalidomide trial, higher number of events in the patients who had the pembrolizumab versus the, without the pembrolizumab. They did not see an improvement in overall response rates. They did not see an improvement in the progression-free survival statistically. So this trial, based upon safety features, which was true with the relapse trial, was discontinued by the FDA. So there are essentially no FDA-approved clinical trials right now that I'm aware of. My colleagues may know of them, or there may be in, uh, individual trials, but there's no large uh, trials being conducted of immunomodulatory drugs and PD-1 inhibitors. The FDA will not support those trials. Maybe you've got institutional trials, but there's no large groups. And that's what's shown on this as well. This is giving you the same basic data when they looked at immune-related adverse events, this is the PEMBRO arm versus the, versus PEMBRO, uh, versus the POM arm. This is the PEMBRO REV arm versus REV alone. This, these drug combinations were significantly toxic. There was no improvement in the, the overall response, and there was no improvement in progression-free survival. These drugs are essentially dead in the U.S. right now. CAR T cells, this is the other era, area of intense interest in the United States and outside of the United States. Uh, a couple of our, of our other speakers and I, our institutions are all participating in one of the trials which I'm going to show you. There are different ways to make these chimeric antigen receptor T cells. Um, there are different criteria for eligibility. Uh, the current um, interest is focused, and it's not the only potential target, but the current focus is on BCMA, which is a B cell maturation antigen. That's the, the target for the antibody generation. It's given a co-stimulatory molecule in a viral vector. And these are what the, the vast majority, but not all the clinical trials right now, at least the ones the most furthest advanced, are with the BCMA as the target. There, are, there is some early data of bispecific antibodies combining BCMA with anti-CD3 that are ongoing and show significant activities, and there are also drug conjugates combined with BCMA antibodies that are being used right now for treatment in this. Nippur actually uh, presented the largest trial that's uh, been reported at ASCO. I shouldn't steal her thunder. Um, showing significant activity with this combination. I'm going to show you some of the data in just a second. There are very, very high response rates. They're including to significant MRD negativity with this, this uh, utilization of immune effector cells for the treatment of patients with relapse disease. In our instance, my, my, uh, our, our best patient that uh, we've treated with the CAR T cells was a young lady who was initially diagnosed at 36 years of age. That was 12 years ago. In that la in last 12 years, she's had 19 lines of therapy. We gave her CAR T cells. She went into complete remission. She just relapsed at 18 months, and we're actually retreating her to see if we can get a response again. So this this therapy can be give provide impressive resu results. When you look at the largest trial, I need to point out duration of response, 11 months for the median duration of response. This is, does not appear to be a curative 
treatment at this point in time. I think, and Nippur or Ajay can give their experience, but the longest one that's been reported, the longest patient out that's actually been reported, I think was the original UPenn patient, who's about two and a half years. That's the longest patient in complete remission that I'm aware of. Um, so these patients do have very, very good responses. Unfortunately, we don't know why, and it's being studied, because we're talking about, literally, if you look at all the CAR T-cell patients who've been treated, I'm going to guess worldwide we're talking maybe 150 patients have received this type of therapy with different cell doses, <coughs> different preparations. So MRD negativity appears to be Im important. I'm still not convinced, and I don't know about my colleagues that were actually curing patients. So this is some of the summary of the data. The most impressive data was actually this data here. This is Chinese data that was presented at ASCO, not this last year, but a year ago. And, in June 2017, they showed their data on 35, they had 35 patients, only 19 of them were out more than a year. They had 100% response rate. They had 75% complete response rates at, in this data. And the, of the, at the time they presented the data of the 19 patients, only one of them had relapsed. Still not been reported in a medical journal, this study from China. The study that Nippur presented is, I'll maybe make sure I get the right one, or she'll tell me I didn't. I believe it, it's this one. Is this right? It was 22 patients that was presented. Um, the response rates, again, exceed, extremely high. Again, you have to have refractory. All these patients were really almost on their deathbed, a good, I mean, a good proportion of them. You had to have an image, you had to have a proteasome inhibitor, you had to have a monoclonal antibody. You had to be re progressing at the time you got treated with these cells. So they had a 95% response rate of the patients who uh, had a complete response. 100% of them were uh, MRD negative, but when you look at their median duration of response, even though we had such a high response rate, it's only 11 months. What was just reported, and I apologize, you can't read this, just came out in the August issue of Journal of Clinical Oncology was the, uh, an update from the original paper from the NIH by Korkendorfer's group with 16 patients, I think it is, um, again, having excellent response rates, but again, the median progression uh, of response was about a year. So it's still, we're all in the learning process. If you look at the numbers of these trials, this is a relatively up-to-date um, information. And you see the number of patients that are included. We're talking actually still very, very few patients, com especially compared to our lymphoma and leukemia colleagues. So in the future, what are we going to do? There's all kinds of trials being done with CAR T cells, including upfront trials, not upfront initial trials, but transplant versus CAR T cells, because someone may or may not ask me if this is effective and we apply it earlier in the disease course, is this going to supplant transplant? No idea, but that trial's um, about to uh, uh, open and uh, start accrual. Um, we're combining it with other, eight, there's other targets we could use, CD38, kappa light change, uh, ESO is another one. There's a lot of different other ways. We're trying to figure out why the patients relapse. Some of them become BCMA, which is expressed on all plasma cells. They become BCMA negative. Um, part of the issue is the cells die off over time and you can lose that response. So if the patients become BCMA negative, the cells have nothing to do, they just kind of uh, die off over time. So there's newer technologies to make, the, make memory CAR T cells so that they'll stay in the body. So if the cells re-express or represent themselves, that they will be available. They're trying to come up with a universe to prepare CAR T cells. It takes about four weeks after a lymphophoresis, not very convenient. So there are certainly off-the-shelf CAR T-cells that are in development. And of course, we'd like to get rid of the viral transduction altogether. Moving on, Deratumab is the uh, equivalent almost of rituximab in lymphoma. You can apply it as it's already been presented. It's approved for frontline therapy, for one to three lines of therapy, and refractory relapse. It's used across the board. There are ongoing studies of it being combined with with a variety of different uh, combinations and also for use in uh, maintenance therapy. 
but it's really not very convenient. You uh, don't have much experience with Duratumumab at all, but the first infusion takes about nine hours. The second one takes about seven hours, and after that, according to the insert, takes about three and a half to four hours. Well, there is now, just like, there, just like rituximab, there is development of a subcutaneous daratumumab. It's effective. This is a trial that was presented, also used, by the way, in amyloid. Um, had, was very, daratumumab is also very effective in amyloid, but this is a subcutaneous um, formulation. When you look at infusion-related reactions, this is this typical IV. It's 40 to 50 percent. Most of this, almost all this is in the first infusion, and, but when you compare it with the subcutaneous, there's very, very few infusion reactions with the subcutaneous formulation. Carfilzomib, the second generation proteasome inhibitor, may or may not be a more potent proteasome inhibitor than bortezomib is also not particularly convenient to administer. It's not as bad as daratumumab, but the intent of carfilzomib is to give it twice a week, two successive days for three weeks. So it's six infusions a month, really not convenient. Patients don't like to come back and forth twice a week, two days in a row. And the question with this agent is, can you give it once a week and be as efficacious as the, by giving it twice a week? So I'm going to show you um, the main uh, study that, of giving carfilzomib once a week, and then I'm going to give you some little highlights of some other carfilzomib-based studies. Uh, Dr. Mateos from Spain presented this study at ASCO called the Arrow Study, where they compared carfilzomib given once a week at 70 milligrams per meter squared versus standard dosing of carfilzomib, which is 27 milligrams per meter squared on days 1, 2, 8, 9, 15, 16. So it's 27 milligrams twice a week versus 70 milligrams once a week, looking for efficacy and toxicities. And what they found here, you can't read this very well, but this is actually statistically significant. With this is the 70 milligram per meter squared dose was superior as far as the efficacy compared to the once a week with an improvement of about four months in progression-free survival given once a week. So more efficacious. And then the next question you should ask is, what about toxicities? And there's this reputation that carfilzomib can cause significant cardiac, cardiac toxicities. It may cause some cardiac toxicities higher than bortezomib. Bortezomib rarely can do it, but it can. So the question is, if you give this drug 70 milligrams per meter squared, do you give over twice the dose once a week? Does it have an increase in the toxicities? And if you look at cardiac failure, it's essentially exactly the same whether you get the once weekly at 70, or if you get the twice weekly at 27. So there was no increase in toxicities by almost by over doubling the dose and giving it once a week. Venetoclax, which I don't know if you can get here either for your CLL patients, Artur is saying no. Venetoclax is the BCL2 inhibitor that's approved in, in uh, uh, the United States for treatment of CLL and also, I, I believe, for mantle cell lymphoma, is a BCL2 inhibitor. Actually has no activity by itself, or very little activity, let me change that, uh, by itself. Has some activity with dexamethasone and has even more activity when you combine it with a proteasome inhibitor. Two papers were published last year of venetoclax. They were back-to-back -back in the journal Blood. The first one was by uh, Saji Kumar where he gave venetoclax dexamethasone to patients only with 1114, and, excuse me, to, to myeloma patients. Response rates in the 1114 patients was about 40%, and the patients who did not have 1114 translocations was about 20%. The paper adjacent to it was reported by Philippe Moreau, where he took venetoclax dexamethasone and combined it with bortezomib, and he's found response rates of about 75%, and it did not depend specifically on the 1114 translocation. So this is carfilzomib. I'm not gonna go through the mechanisms of BCL2, working through different pathways from the NF-kappa B, but there are different pathways that actually, uh, where the pathways cross to get activity, one through MCL1 and one through um, NF-kappa B. They, this is a phase one, two trial where they did use different 
uh, doses of venetoclax and different doses of carfilzomib. Bottom line, small trial, again, it's a small phase one, two trial. There's only 30 patients. When you look at the patients, the overall response rates were in the 80% range. When they looked at bortezomib refractory patients and they gave them carfilzomib with venetoclax, they still got a response rate of 86%. So you could actually overcome proteasome inhibitor refractoriness by giving another proteasome with venetoclax. What about the cytogenetic risk categorization? Here's this group, small number of patients. I'm not going to say that that's not true. There's only seven patients with 1114. They had 100% response rates. But when you look at other high-risk cytogenetics, again, small numbers, this combination was very efficacious of giving venetoclax with carfilzomib. When they looked at toxicities, toxicities were very similar to what they see in patients treated with other hemologic malignancies given the venetoclax, mainly GI toxicities of diarrhea and some mild nausea. But what about giving carfilzomib? Again, we're on the once a week idea right now. It's saving it twice a week, carfilzomib with lenalidomide. There were two studies, both of them were small. One was 28 patients, the other one was 22 patients. Bottom line was that when you give carfilzomib with lenalidomide on a once a week schedule, the overall response rates were actually very good. 93% overall response rates with 89% better than a VGPR by giving it once a week. The toxicities, though, were a little bit higher when you gave it once a week. And the dose that but both the studies ultimately came to was using the 56 milligrams per meter squared dose in combination with lenalidomide. But response rates, small studies, 93%, 90%, and much more convenient to give this on days 1, 8, and 15 than giving it twice a week. Um, Daratumab, we, uh, Dr. Nuka has already presented some Daratumab uh, uh, KRD, I think it was scheduled. This was Daratumab with carfilzomib dexamethasone. It's uh, a little bit different schedule because they split the dose. I don't want to belabor this. They also use a unique um, carfilzomib dosing because they actually gave the carfilzomib in this study at 70 milligrams per meter squared. But basically, this is a Daratumumab instead of, well, we already showed you, it's already approved with bortezomib. This is looking at Daratumab with carfilzomib, and you get very good response rates in the 75 to 80 percent range, and you get fairly good depth of response, too, when you look at the CR rates of 18 and 26. These are rev, ref, these are rev refractory patients given uh, daratumab carfilzomib. These are all patients, and you're seeing a very good response rates, and the depth of response is very good. Uh, my last, next last section is looking at other combinations. This was. Um, just it's going to be approved, I'm certain, by the FDA in the near future, is taking pomalidomide, bortezomib, dexamethasone. All, almost all myeloma studies show that three, are better, three drug regimens are better than two. This is another one. This is pomalidomide, bortezomib, dexamethasone versus bortezomib, dexamethasone. Um, because I know you use a lot of bortezomib here, if I also know you don't have access to the pomalidomide. But these are one to three lines of prior therapy. They had to have previous lenalidomide and been refractory to lenalidomide. And then they were treated with pomalidomide, uh, uh, bortezomib dexamethasone, or bortezomib dexamethasone. And what we see here is there was a significant improvement, about four month improvement, progression free survival of the triplet of the imid proteasome inhibitor dexamethasone versus the doublet. There was a small study looking at elotuzumab, the SLAMF7 inhibitor, in combination with the triplet. Um, very heavily pretreated group. About, you know, we look at the prior lines of therapy. You know, they had, these were a small study, but fairly heavily pretreated group. And what they see in this study was that they did get pretty impressive response rates. Doesn't project well, very well, of 50 some percent in this group of patients. At EHA, not at ASCO, there was a trial of elotuzumab POMDEX versus POMDEX in relapse refractory disease. Phase two trial of about 60 patients in each arm, elotuzumab POMDEX versus POMDEX. Over median progression-free survival is about six months, six months longer by adding the monoclonal antibody 
to standard palm dex. So the last drug I want to talk about, which may or may not be the next drug that gets approved in the US is Selenexor. It's a uh, nuclear transport inhibitor that also has very little activity by itself, but does have activity with dexamethasone. This is called the STORM trial. It's Selenexor in combination with low-dose dexamethasone. And these are patients that are unbelievably heavily treated. These are quad refractory or pentarefractory. So some of these patients had also had not only two imids, two proteasome inhibitors, but also a monoclonal antibody. So these were very heavily treated patients. When you looked at the overall response rate in the quad refractory, just this combination, it was, it's not overly robust. It's about 20%. And same thing is essentially true with the pentarefractory, but these are patients who had no other options really available to them. These, this drug is now being combined with all kinds of other drugs, proteasome inhibitors, monoclonal antibodies, but based on this data for an unmet need, this is probably the next drug that will probably be approved by the FDA for patients with relapsed refractory disease to four or more types of therapy. One of the problems with this drug, for the few of us that may have used it, it causes a lot of GI toxicity, it causes uh, anorexia and diarrhea in these patients. It's not easy to tolerate uh, because of the GI toxicities. That's the main drawback of this drug. So there was a small studies, just to give you a, a idea, we're dealing with a small number. They're calling this STOMP. It's only 22 patients. This is com combination of this this uh, inhibitor Selenexor with bortezomib, overall response rates were in the 80% range. Patients who are PI refractory, 43%. So you can take bortezomib refractory patients, add Selenexor, and get a small number of patients, but you can get a response rate that's fairly respectable in this group of patients. So in summary, um, once weekly carfilzomib, I'm sure based on that ARO study, it was a very large international phase three trial has been submitted for, um, I'm certain, been submitted for FDA approval to give it 70 milligrams per meter squared. Combination of carfils and lenalidomide dex once a week appears in small phase one, two trials, appears to be potent, but we have to be careful of some of the toxicity associated with that. Uh, proteasome inhibitors with monoclonal antibodies, whether it's bortezomib or carfilzomib, are very active. Uh, venetoclax approved for other hematologic malignancies when combined with proteasome inhibitors, whether it's carfilzomib or bortezomib, seems to be very promising. CAR T cell data is really where all the excitement is almost in myeloma right now. It's almost impossible to get patients on our trials because the slots are so few and far between. Very, very potent treatment. We need to make it last longer and hopefully utilize it in patients that are not so heavily treated. Um, cytokine release syndrome, which you see in lymphoma and leukemia, is much less in the myeloma patients than it is in the lymphoma and leukemia patients treated with other CAR T cell models. PD-1 inhibitors, pembrolizumab, nivolumab, probably never going to be approved for the treatment of myeloma. Subcutaneous deratumab is certainly going to be a very important time saver. The efficacy is probably the same, but it's going to save a lot of time once it becomes subcutaneous. You can, because you use a lot of bortezomib in this country, um, it would certainly be nice uh, if you'd get pomalidomide to combine with it. As I've shown you, it's a, it is a very potent regimen um, as compared to pomalidomide dexamethasone. Elatuzumab, another one monoclonal antibodies, also has uh, about over twice the progression-free survival to pomalidomide dexamethasone alone. And Selenixor, this uh, nuclear um, transport protein inhibitor, is probably the next drug that's going to get approved for relapsed refractory disease in myeloma. And with that, I'll end. Thank you.